everyone, I'm Nama Budu, Membership Manager at Cambridge University Hospitals and also member of the CIPR Health Committee. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our first digital event. I'll now hand over to our host, Jude Tipper. Jude, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Namu. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the um, first digital event for um, the CIPR Health Group. So my name's Jude. I'm the um, Head of Communications Professional at NHS Digital. I'm also the Assistant Head of the Strategic Programme Marketing Comms Team. So we live and breathe digital transformation in the NHS every single day. So um, I'll be your host this afternoon. So um, just to let you know that this event is being recorded. Um, so do feel free to switch off your camera if you don't want to be on screen. And the recording link will be shared after the event. So the purpose of today's event is to find out how health systems are using digital to transform healthcare and enhance people's experiences. So we're gonna hear from three fantastic speakers on the digital changes that are happening in their area. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the, um, of the event. So I'm delighted to first of all, introduce our speakers to you. So first up, we have Chris Gibbons. So Chris is a director of um, digital health and technology transformation at KPMG. Chris has worked at a national level and with healthcare providers for over a decade. He sits on the board of a voluntary community social enterprise mental health provider delivering IAPT services across England and specialist services in the Northeast. For those of you not quite up on your NHS acronyms, IAPT stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. So Chris has led on digital strategy, road mapping and large scale delivery engagement for several national services, including enterprise resource planning, digital workplace, cybersecurity and infrastructure services. His experience at a local level is focused on clinical systems transformation and digital strategy development. Chris lives in Cumbria, where he can often be found ticking off the Wainwrights or paddle boarding in the Lake District. Next up, we have Mari Coxon, who is Group Marketing Director at Adelphi Group of Companies. Mari has worked in digital transformation and marketing strategy for fast moving consumer healthcare for over 10 years. Companies she's worked for include Johnson & Johnson, GSK, RB and Philips Consumer Healthcare. And finally, I'd like to introduce Amar Masari. I'm proud to say he's one of my colleagues at NHS Digital, um, acting as a research and insight manager. <clears throat> Amar is an award-winning behavioral insight specialist, currently leading on insight for a national data program at NHS Digital. He's experienced in digital health and public health, having worked on local, regional and national behaviour change campaigns to improve public health outcomes. As a researcher for good, Amar brings an empathetic lens to insights by amplifying and advocating the audience voice. Outside of work, Amar is an avid baker with a great love for musicals, hiking and swimming, and I can certainly vouch for his baking skills. So what I'm going to do now is for the next half an hour, I'm going to hand over to our fantastic panellists because you certainly don't want to hear from me gibbering on. Um, if you do have any questions as these speakers are presenting, feel free to pop those in the chat as you go along so you don't forget them or I can get them at the end um, and you can stick your hands up. But for now, I see Chris is prepped and ready to go. So I'll hand over to you, Chris. Thank you. Brilliant. And then thank you for the, the introduction there. It's really great to spend time uh, with this community this afternoon uh, on, on such an important topic and, and particularly given this community's role in advancing digital health in the future. And that will really be the theme um, throughout the discussion that I want to have this afternoon. Um, there are so many opportunities to improve access, to improve experience and fundamentally improve outcomes for citizens and for the workforce utilizing digital health but the ability to deliver on that is really i believe a question of trust we work across a number of uh, health systems globally um back in in september i spent time uh, with some of my colleagues across the the g6 and what was really striking was the similarities in the challenges that health systems are facing across the world that they're very rarely uh, unique uh, 
they're all unique in the way they deliver care, but the challenges are often very, uh, very similar. And you'll all be very familiar with those yourselves. It's about access. So how do we better understand the needs of populations uh, and improve equitable access to healthcare uh, and for groups that often struggle uh, to access healthcare for, uh, for one reason or another? The second is demand. Uh, we'll all see in our day-to-day -day roles of the increase in demand for healthcare uh, and the larger proportion of citizens that are presenting with multiple chronic conditions and the aging population that we see across the world. Thirdly, workforce, uh, and particularly, particularly acute given the back, coming off the back of the pandemic, um, there is real challenges across work workforce globally, um, both in being able to attract and retain, but also just look after the well-being of the workforce to ensure that they're able to be as productive as possible in their roles, but also happy and, and be able to be retained in the system. Uh, at the moment, we, we're facing a huge workforce uh, gap across England, particularly uh, with the projections looking like there'll be around 180,000 gaps uh, in the healthcare workforce by 23, 24. The cost of delivering care is increasing due to inflationary pressures, aging estates, and some of the supply chain challenges that we've seen given a number of geopolitical events that we see across the world at the moment and, and in the past. Um, the, the affordability challenge, uh, you know, it, it's one about continuing to in, increase investment in healthcare, but two, again, really starting to think about different ways of being able to deliver care that's moving away perhaps from bricks and mortar uh, in the way that we've delivered healthcare around uh, organisation boundaries in the past. Uh, and then finally, to be able to deliver on, um, you know, the response to some of these challenges, the digital data and technology capability that's required is, is significant. And globally across every industry right now, there's a real, uh, uh, a real sort of war on talent and the ability to, uh, you know, be able to build that capability within organizations and build it sustainably. And that's particularly acute uh, in, in health and social care. But it's not all doom and gloom. These are all challenges. I think um, we'd all recognize them. Uh, and I'd like to propose that actually a number of these challenges, part of the solution is about how we bring digital health uh, into, into, the, in, into, our, uh, into our lives. And I, I really believe that digital health is not about necessarily sticking technology out there, hoping it gets adopted, uh, and then there's some magical benefit at the end of it. We're really talking about redefining models of care, utilizing technology to support that. But it's not just about utilizing technology, it's about how different ecosystems are coming together um, from less, you know, more traditional ways of delivering healthcare. So it's long been, you know, the, the, the integration between health and social care uh, con continues to be a challenge, but it's, you know, it, it's a fairly proven model of bringing together uh, professionals and practitioners across the NHS and social care, but actually the role of private healthcare, the role of life sciences, and the role of retail and consumer health in the future care models is going to be uh, particularly interesting. And that's because I, I believe that we will see, start to see future care models that are delivered uh, closer to the individual, closer to the citizen, and again, not between organisational boundaries. This is about how you know, you, you might be able to access uh, things through, you know, uh, whether it's your opticians, whether it's your supermarket, whether it's when you access that, when you go to the pharmacy, be able to access different types of services via those non-traditional routes, albeit with, against the guidance, the support, and the capability that exists within uh, traditional healthcare environments. And some of the technology that's making that, uh, uh, making that achievable and that is helping to sort of deliver on those care models are things like clinical decision support systems. So how do you use uh, technology to bring larger samples of data together that it's constantly learning, it's constantly understanding the data points and is able to iterate clinical decision support and support clinicians to make those decisions at the point of care based on uh, just uh, based on the, the, the data as well alongside the kind of clinical judgment. Second theme around AI and automation, 
uh, AI gets banded around. I think we're all probably a little bit tired of AI, uh, albeit, uh, you know, we are starting to see the maturity of the discussion change quite significantly. And going back to the challenge around workforce, um, AI and automation is a huge opportunity to reduce the burden on the workforce and to support citizens in being able to make decisions independently about their own health and well-being. Thirdly, uh, I wanted to touch on patient engagement platforms. So we're seeing loads of these platforms open up that are not just about you know, patient portals and digital front doors. They're actually about how do you bring communities of patients together that are experiencing similar, um, similar challenges in their life, be it, uh, be it particularly in the mental health space or in, uh, in the cancers, you know, be able to bring communities of people together to self-support each other and just get that reassurance. And have you, did you have this experience? Did you have that experience? How did you approach this? Um, and to be able to sort of support some of that sort of self-monitoring and be more aware um, of when they might want to get help and the right points to get help. Remote monitoring is quite literally uh, uh, you know, booming. Uh, and there's been some great uh, examples, particularly during the pandemic, of where remote monitoring has been uh, used to support people in their own homes, be it about oximetry, uh, be it about blood glucose, be it about various different types of monitoring um, to be able to manage people in their homes safely. And the emphasis being on the word safely um, so that the person has that reassurance that they are um, being supported, they are able to understand that uh, their signs and symptoms, um, and they are, they are aware of where to get help when it's needed. And then finally, I want to touch a bit on um, on the metaverse and mixed reality, and that's effectively um, how do you uh, experience uh, healthcare uh, in a in a virtual world, be it augmented reality, be it virtual reality. Um, and we're seeing loads and loads of great examples of where um, citizens and patients are using uh, uh, vir virtual reality as an example to support uh, things like pain management. And it's been particularly successful. Uh, and some of the best examples actually down in the Southwest uh, where folks have been trialing these technologies to support patients. Um, I'm wearing my hat uh, up with mental health concern where I'm uh, sit on the board. You know, we've been bringing a number of those uh, technologies together. Uh, so, for example, the, the AI piece, being able to support uh, patients uh, self-referring to some of our services uh, and to be able to complete the initial triage uh, in an automated fashion to get people to the right place as quickly as possible. And we've seen our access statistics improve significantly and um, be able to uh, identify groups of people people who um, perhaps we can support in a collective fashion so we'll support more people at the right time and be able to build that peer support and equally now starting to look at how do we bring mixed reality into the mix um, for folks who are thinking about their kind of well-being and be able to sort of self-support themselves in their own homes but fundamentally what underpins all of this is there's a lot of new there's a lot of new relationships between organizations there's a lot of new technologies and a lot of new experiences for, for me as an individual accessing care. So really this comes back to trust and really being able to trust in digital health in the future and be able to bring uh, you know, real, real sort of comfort that I will get the help that I need where I need it, when I need it. And that will really underpin adoption of some of these themes in the future um, and be able to support folks uh, in, in, utilizing some of these future care models. And I want to wrap up and, and uh, really on some of the key ingredients that I believe are important in building trust and being able to effectively close the execution gap between this is this is the, uh, the the rhetoric and the hype, and this is reality. And being able to do that, I believe there's three kind of core ingredients. One, it's about inclusive design, and this goes far beyond traditional public patient involvement initiatives. This is really about uh, co-designing services with citizens and not just do that uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in traditional senses, but inclusive in every sense of the word. How do we get access to folks who are uh, a, a part of lesser served communities and really ensure that digital isn't exacerbating uh, inequalities, is actually helping close 
uh, ga gaps in inclusion. The second, um, I see lots of organizations look at things like cyber, uh, look at things like information governance, how you actually look, run live services as a bit of a tick box exercise. If we're really gonna build trust in digital health, these things are enablers of digital health transformation. They're not blockers and they're not tick boxes and we should treat them as enablers in that fashion. I've heard folks use the, the old adage a few times, of, you can change bank, but you can't change NHS. And if we're gonna really be able to build uh, trust in the, the use of digital health services, particularly in the NHS, these ingredients are absolutely key in being able to do that. And then finally, uh, very relevant to this community, um, communications uh, from day one all the way through implementation and beyond. Um, I see lots of comms teams that get engaged at, just before go live that says, hey, we're going to do this thing. Can you go and tell the people we think it might impact? And here's, here's some stuff we want to tell them. Um, it's, it doesn't work. This is about open and transparent communication throughout delivery. Um, and often I see uh, that open and transparent bit is absolutely key. You know, when we look at other countries, particularly during the pandemic, where they were adopting things like contact tracing services, they were extremely open in the way that they delivered those. They invited thought leaders, they invited commentators in to get under the bonnet of the technology and really understand it. They invited the media in to be able to address their concerns from the outset and to be able to make people feel informed of the decisions that they were making about how they were using those services. And only if we get these ingredients like right, do I think we'll be able to deliver on digital health. But I do think that it's absolutely key uh, in being able to uh, deliver healthcare in the future to the level of quality we expect and be able to improve access and experiences of those who have to, who those are engaging in health and care. It's ubiquitous to us. Uh, and I care absolutely passionately about the role of digital health and be able to uh, continue to support that in the future. So I think uh, I'm going to hand back to yourself, Jude, uh, to uh, hand over to uh, one of the other speakers. Fabulous. Thanks, Chris. That was some really thought provoking stuff and much of it resonated with me in the way we try to do things at NHS Digital, how we try and involve comms from the outset. It is, you're right, it's a constant battle, but um, I think it's one that we've gradually won that people can see the benefit of doing that. Um, I also loved your theme of trust. Um, there's a quote that I use quite often, which is that um, progress moves at the speed of trust. And I think it's, it's very, very true. So fabulous presentation, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna hand over now to Mari. So Mari, if you'd like to share your slides. So Mari is going to talk to us about um, a viewpoint on digital transformation and technology. So Mari, over to you. Great, hi everyone. Thanks, Chris, that was really interesting. Um, I'll do the usual Zoomy thing and just check that my earpiece is working and you can actually hear me before I walk to myself. Fantastic, <laughs> thank you. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me. I, I kind of feel quite humbled by the wealth of experience of the speakers I'm sandwiched between. Um, but I will do my best to bring the sort of healthcare industry viewpoint that I have from myself. And because I'm talking about the healthcare industry, my first slide is actually um, quite a nice large um, disclaimer. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome to Pharma. Uh, just a declaration that um, these opinions that I'm sharing are completely my own. Um, they are not uh, anyone else's opinion and I'm not speaking on behalf of any company. Um, I'm using uh, publicly available knowledge and information from healthcare industry in here, so I'm not sharing any top secrets. Um, and they're not a reflection or a direct opinion of any of the healthcare companies that I've worked for previously um, or that I'm currently working with either as an employee or marketing consultant. Finally, I don't receive any monies or compensation because there are a few things I mentioned to help bring the story to life. I'm in marketing, so I need to bring my story to life. Um, but I'm not receiving any money or compensation from those products. Um, I've just chosen them as examples. Um, and then maybe just from my own personal perspective before I move into this as well, um, I've had a foot injury, um, which I went through e-consult and took loads of photographs of my terrible foot in in injury. Um, and I went and had my ultrasound to find out that there was a bit more of a problem 
um, and I followed up with another telephone and then e-consult. So I have so far not seen a clinician and I've managed to self-refer myself to physio, which is what I'm going to need to repair. So I hope I'm a living example of how we can start to move forward with digital um, and really reduce the burden on the NHS. Um, but that's my patient perspective. Today, I'm actually talking more about um, how industry might be able to support and partner. I think uh, Chris mentioned it really nicely there about sort of consumer health, about some of that softer social societal piece. Um, and certainly that um, co-creation, which has been a good buzz forever. But before I go into that, I just wanted to kind of ground us in the reality, but areas that industry is very aware of as well. Digital is a brilliant solution, but um, as a solution, it's not total inclusion. And we must remember that um, there's lots of positives. So loads of people, and this is the, the research I'm sure everyone read, October 2022, it came out. But, you know, um, most adults in the UK are using an app to meet some kind of health or social care need um, just now. Um, I'm one in two, 49%, but I'm a marketer, so I made it look more fuzzy. 49% uh, are reporting an improvement in their health and well-being by using that. But we mustn't forget that 6% of uh, UK homes have no internet access at all and therefore no way of getting to this. Um, and inequality is obviously the NHS long-term plan um, you know, has, has been around for a while trying to address those health inequalities. The government buzz of levelling up, you know, um, that's not going away. So older citizens the financially vulnerable people living alone, people impacted with limiting conditions, um, and, and that includes physical and mental. Um, and then add into our melting pot that is the UK, language barriers, perhaps reading level barriers, um, understanding the need for plain language, and trying to have plain language in our digital language, and it does get a bit more complex. And I thought, interestingly, um, I think it went from about 5% saying that they would like to have some digital training locally available to 35 percent and you know my I'm again using my real life my 80 year old father not being able to get into the library training so that he could work out how to do his banking properly because he really was struggling getting to grips with the apps and it, no matter how much I'd shown him on the iPad so I think it is a really big part I don't think it's a total solution um, I think industry is aware of that as well um, when they're thinking about it um, then I wanted to kind of point out that it wasn't that new. Uh, I think Chris mentioned some of those buzzy gadgets. Sorry, because I've worked on loads of them where they made it just for fun because they wanted to, you know, and I think they'd moved a long way. And actually, funnily enough, some of the things, the buzzy things that I first started on in, in Philips in 2010 have actually served a better purpose. They were maybe invented without a purpose at that point, but they've moved on. Um, so they were one of the first sort of smart watches, but it was just designed to measure your heartbeat um, and predict if you were going to be in distress. That was where it originally came from. They hadn't really thought about measuring whether you sleep, how many steps, I mean, who doesn't count their steps, you know, um, all of those things that have kind of moved forward there as well. And, and I remember getting shortlisted for a pitch we did saying connecting this and some saliva testing to stress levels could really help reduce uh, sickness in workplace and we wanted to get some money within Philips to do that we didn't win but you could kind of see where the idea was coming from and that was what 12 years ago then there was a connected piece on on weight um, a connected piece on um, the toothbrush which I'll come back to shortly as well and um, so it wasn't new but it was quite basic it wasn't co-created it was look at what we can do let's do it I think exactly what Chris was saying and then if I move to my sort of next company that I, I worked with really in this area, um, although I was at REC, it's less so in digital, uh, GSK had some fantastic stuff moving forward. Um, I, I particularly loved the flu tracker, it's quite a cool image there, and that's because that was how they won, it was a marketing piece, you know, they won, but actually that flu tracker it was incredibly important, being able to track and predict when flu would rise, um, using Google data, um, a really fantastically helpful tool to self, to people, that could be accessed, but also to um, healthcare industry. And then the asthma app um, as well, which is, I think it's probably been through about five iterations since I last saw it. Um, but the area that I was most interested in was then bringing that to the pharmacist or the healthcare professional and helping support them in their monitoring and um, through the use of some of that data collection. 
Then my last last piece that I, I worked on was Johnson and Johnson, um, who had introduced a, a smart tracking for nicotine replacement therapy, so that people could track um, their use and help sort of incentivize to start to reduce as they got through their their smoking cessation program um, and some advice that went with it. And that's now iterated into uh, a combination, which I'll come back to um, um, shortly, which is um, using the the NRT, the medicine, and combining it with uh, coaching and support, um, NHS approved coaching and support CBT to help them. Because we know that you're four times more likely to quit if you actually have that support as well as the medicine um, to stop smoking. So these are all quite good examples of how industries tried to tap into uh, self-motivated, I guess, if you like, um, healthcare management. Um, then I just wanted to share like sort of three of my favourite examples that started as industry and are now in the NHS in some form. They're either in the approved, I was going to say approved app library, but that doesn't exist anymore. So they must be attached to the NHS app or something. I'm showing my age by saying there was a library. Um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, these are sort of three of my, my, my favourite. Um, and then I've got a couple of what I think might be coming next from my own industry experience. So the sleepy old one I love because it's now available to every adult in the NHS Scotland. I, I kind of, I quite like that, that as a UK wide, we tend to test in Scotland and Wales quite often, and then it might come into England. Um, but this is just available to everyone. It was a doctor that couldn't sleep, had insomnia, and couldn't get the help that he wanted, so designed that digital help. It was done, in, of course, from a doctor's perspective, so clinical evidence had to be there. You know, they wanted some sort of evidence base. Um, and so it's available to everybody um, and now in two forms, the sort of insomnia piece, but also the this, this stress um, and anxiety management. Then there's the DigiBT, which people will be familiar with, which is uh, for children and adults um, with type 1 diabetes. And that is very much linked to the NHS now, but started off as an independent programme, um, again, quite often coming from a patient's perspective. Um, and then Brush DJ, I, I, um, I know Ben well, who started this. I remember him starting the idea of it's frustrating that people don't brush their teeth for long enough. Um, so you're meant to brush for around about two minutes. That will get most of the gunk out of your mouth. But the national average is about 47 seconds. How do we help people? So it started with an idea of just using the songs within the tech you had, meeting you where you were, which was the start of a crumb of a good idea, meeting people where they are. Um, and it built into a kind of much more educational app and, and it's linked in and, and has won several awards since then too. Um, and, and it's great because it's your own music. So just brushing for a bit longer by dancing along how you're doing it. And some of these are more um, obvious than others. I'm not here talking about AI working with a, with a you know, specialist to, to diagnose breast cancer at a better level. I'm not at that high level. I'm at some of the stuff that really chips away at the resource in the NHS, which is those more time consuming, softer subjects. Um, and that's where industry can really play a part, I think, to come in there um, from a consumer piece. Obviously, I think pharmaceutical has a different journey and is, is doing that. And some of the big tech, healthcare tech companies are, are those ones that will be working to you know, improve diagnosis. But these softer and more accessible things really could combine to make a big difference, which kind of leads me to my sort of last bit of where do I see the future coming? And that is digital is not all inclusive. So we do always need a human element. And even that amazing AI, the breast cancer example was what, 96% accurate. The human was 94, put them together, it was 99. I, I'm making that up. Please don't quote me on that. But you know, it basically showed that we need to combine the two to really succeed. And these are a couple of areas that I'm personally quite interested in. I, I found out about pain D only just recently as a really interesting concept. Quite often it's come from either patients or carers or families, you know, again, that motivation. But there's two areas that drain resource quite heavily in the, in the NHS and are quite often linked to physical and mental well-being of, of people. Um, and so this sort of care of pain management, pain care, pain management, this combined model, which is still that digital support, is still the tracking of pain management, what they're doing, how they're feeling, tracking of that emotional well-being, 
but then the societal piece so communities and patient groups like you were talking about Chris and my favorite example is when I was asking more about it and um, when I was when I'd heard about it I, I reached out and asked more um, is that they have a knitting group because knitting is really particularly good for people who have pain in their hands and um, so they have a knitting group you know why not why not have that knitting group why not connect that digitally why not make that accessible to more people and um, so I think there's something coming that's going to combine and digital become digital becomes the enabler which is my favorite buzzword in my current job I'm not here to get rid of the sales team in the job that I work in I work in healthcare packaging now I'm here to enable that team to give a better outcome to those labs and innovators that I work with now. Um, and I also think dementia was something when I was at Philips, we were working on a lot and we were working with dementia, people living with dementia, carers supporting with dementia, and then the, the actual societal health groups, those, those social groups as well. Uh, we met in Liverpool several times over a year and it was incredibly energizing to be part of that. So there's something about exactly Chris said that that combination of patient, that um, you know carer uh, and professional coming in, and industry has a role in that to play too. Um, conscious, I don't want to run over. Possibly have, and apologies. This is my final statement, really, which just kind of summarises everything I've gone gone through, and that is, industry really can pioneer um, and partner with healthcare. Um, it has to be controlled. It has to be measured and a very very transparent as Chris said um, to really um, start to redress that digital inequality improve the patient outcomes and ultimately reduce the burden on the NHS resources which has become more important than anything um, in, in the last little while so um, I will thank you very much ping up my name it's quite an unusual spelling you can find me in any of these as long as Twitter stays alive. It might only be three by the end of this presentation, who knows? Um, but always happy to connect and, and hear more ideas. Thank you very much, guys, for letting me share my opinion and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Mari. That was fabulous. You took me back when you were talking about a knitting group. In my previous life as a head of comms in an NHS trust, um, one of the groups that won a trust award um, was a knitting group. And I was the sucker in charge of the music that had to play when they went up to collect their awards. So little fact for you today that um, if you ever need a knitting song, Fraggle Rock did one once. So there you go. Imagine that blasting out with 200 people in their glad rags. But um, it was a lot of fun. It was a brilliant group, brilliant group for all the reasons that you mentioned. So I'm going to hand over to Amar now. Um, Amar has a tantalising title of his presentation and hasn't yet told us what cash machines do have to do with it. So let's um, let's find out from Amar what the hell he's on about. Over to you. Thank you, Jude. Hi, everyone. It's brilliant to be um, here today. Uh, we've had some great um, uh, speakers this afternoon, and there's quite a few themes that I think have kind of woven through um, across both talks, and some of those weave through mine. Um, so uh, I'm going to... Uh, kind of talk about a lot of the experiences that um, I've had when I've worked on a lot of um, digitizing healthcare projects. Um, so my background is within behavior change and social marketing. Um, and what I really want to bring forward is around a lot of the learnings in terms of building the audience voice and developing that digital journey. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to kind of look at um, digital in all of our lives. It takes lots of different shapes and forms. Some of us might have all of these things in our lives. Some of us might have some of them. Um, personally, it was quite fascinating kind of seeing how my parents kind of took to um, mobile phones once they started becoming touch screens. Um, kind of within the space of about two or three years, they went from telling us off being, being on our phones too often to themselves being on their phones longer than we were. So it's quite an interesting um, kind of experience. And what I wanted to take from that was that we all have different relationships when it comes to digital. Um, so some of us might be, you know, welcoming digital with open arms, willing to embrace all of its forms, um, both current and what's likely to, to come in the future. Um, some of you might recognize the picture that I've used for this kind of group. Um, it's a Black Mirror episode where 
uh, there's a piece of tech that uses your DNA to create a sentient kind of VR version of you. Um, and it's all inspired by Star Trek. And you put this device on and it kind of puts you into this sentient VR world that you're in. Some of us might be um, not so quite as advanced and we tend to use tech for everyday things um, and anything from calling somebody to doing your shopping uh, or sending a message. And then there are those at the complete other end of the spectrum who don't really trust digital, um, aren't really that open to digital um, or have their own viewpoints that are kind of fundamentally driving their view on how they use digital products. It's quite fascinating because this might not be one homogenous group. It can be anybody from a very young population to a population that might be more kind of um, thought of as being in that group. We've spoken, I think, a lot about equality, but I wanted to take it a step back and look at inequity. Um, when we're looking at digital health and producing digital products and services, I think we really need to pivot into this place of looking about um, how do we break those barriers down when we're trying to get people to access services and products. So I think it's the recognition of that not everybody has the same starting blocks rather than not everybody has the same opportunity to access a service is going to completely change and pivot um, how we look, think and talk about digital products and how we want them to be used. So one of the things that I really believe is that good comms use evidence to um, uh, deliver your messages. Um, but to take that one step forward, and to do great comms, you need to be able to take people with you along, along on that journey. And it might not be the same journey for everybody, but it's something that does need to be considered if you want to have a more meaningful impact um, on your audiences. And the way to do that, I believe, is building from the ground up. Um, so I'm a little bit biased when I'm kind of talking about building from the ground up, um, being an insight uh, specialist. Um, but I do believe that one of the first things you need to do is giving yourself the space and time to actually take a step back from what you've been kind of commissioned to do per se um, and look at what your audience's needs and wants are um, and what their pain points are. The second that you start to have that dialogue and that conversation, you'll start to build a bit of a framework in terms of how that product or that service could be used in your audience's day-to-day -day life. Which brings me to the second point, which is around empathy-driven insight can be a powerful tool. Um, a lot of the times we use data to kind of evidence um, why we want a product to be used or how we want it to be used. And that data tends to come in very traditional forms. It might be something that's quantitative, like a survey, or it might be relying a lot on um, interviews or focus groups. Um, but immersing yourself in your audience's world really can take you that one step beyond. So spending time with your audiences, observing a lot of ethnographic research is completely eye-opening and gives you that different perspective of what the issue is that you're trying to solve with a digital product or service. Third point is around learning how your audience speaks um, and particularly within the uh, kind of field that I'm working on, um, it's difficult to talk to your audiences uh, in a way that you think they'll understand because if you don't do that engagement, you can't build that clear picture of what's the best way to communicate a message and how does that message land with your audience. And a lot of that then leads on to how it resonates, how they understand it and how they end up behaving. So potentially trying to communicate a message or even trying to ask a particular, a particular question in a way that you think needs to be asked can completely invalidate what you're trying to do. And then you just make it more difficult to try and get people on board with you. And my final point is around building in continuous engagement. Um, so with a lot of the work that we've been doing when it comes to data, uh, data comms, 
um, we've been trying to weave in continuous engagement at all points um, with our panels. And that's been incredibly valuable in that we're able to get their continuous feedback. They kind of hold us to account on a lot of the times as well. And we get their input in that co-production in at all points as well. So I wanted to talk about that bit of work. Uh, so last year, um, you might have seen in the press that there was a lot of um, headlines about an NHS data grab. Um, I'm working on the project now, and what we've done is a complete reset on how the project was rolling out last year. So we took that opportunity to step back and understand what is it that went wrong. Um, and we did a lot of research to uh, engage with various stakeholders and audiences. Um, and that opportunity to engage with people, engage with the system um, was really valuable in terms of understanding how data is kind of viewed. You know, there are audiences who are completely um, for it and want the NHS to um, use patient data to improve services and health outcomes. Um, there are those who are on the complete other end of the spectrum who are um, completely against it and don't like the idea of it. Then there are some people who have a more emotional connection with data, and that's gonna be the really tricky thing to try and understand and communicate in a meaningful way to them. When we spoke to people, some of them were saying that my GP data is my complete life story. I, some of them might've been with the GP for 30, 40 years, and their family has been with that same GP. So they see it as more than just health data, they see it as their entire life story. So it's really important to build that insight into what we're doing in, from a comms perspective, uh, which we have done, and we're continuing to develop uh, messaging in a way that's working really effectively as part of a uh, campaign. So just to kind of circle back about what cash machines have to do with it, not, not having mentioned cash machines since I've started the presentation. Um, this anecdote really goes back to a project that I did about six years ago. So around the time that um, PHE were developing the One U um, campaign, um, I was working with a local authority who wanted to do something completely separate and localized. Um, and it was completely eye-opening um, they wanted to digitise their entire public health offer to their residents um, and change it from a system that was a one-size-fits-all approach where you can have two people accessing the same free service but one of them might live in a council flat and the other person might live in a £2 million mansion. Um, and we did a lot of engagement and a lot of research to um, understand what the you know how how the residents wanted to use the service what their needs and wants were what the barriers were and one particular person um said something when we were talking about how digital was used in day-to-day -day life and he said that for him a cash machine is not how it can be seen by somebody else his experience of wanting to withdraw money isn't the same as everybody else's. He would go inside to the bank to deal with someone who was human because he didn't believe that a cash machine would just give him his money. He thought that a cash machine would end up taking a lot of his details and a lot of his money. So he had a completely different perspective of how the cash machine would work. And from his perspective, it was almost like a Dalek, something that was evil, something that wasn't really there to help him. Um, and that complete, uh, that experience completely changed my outlook when it comes to how do we use insight and how that informs the development of digital products when they get developed and designed and also how that messaging can be weaved into the comms as well. So I hope that's kind of made a bit of sense. Um, I've got my uh, social handles as well. If anybody wants to uh, connect afterwards, I'm more than happy. Um, but I hope it's been um, eye-opening as well for you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Brilliant and lovely loop background at the end of all that to comms and the importance of comms. So for a CIPR health um, talk, I think that's very relevant. Um, loved the broad range of topics from our speakers. So thank you to all of you.
Um, if anybody's got any questions, please pop them in the chat. I've had a couple that have come through already. So I'll um, I'll pose some of those now to our panelists and panelists, you know, do feel free to to chip on and chip in on each other's answers as well. And anybody's got a chat, pop them a question, pop them in the chat, or else use the um, the little raise raise your hand icon as well if you'd like to ask your question yourself. But I'll kick off with one that was um, directed at Chris, um, which I think is a theme that run through all of your presentations anyway. Um, but what practical steps can be taken? to increase access and provide the benefits of digital health to digitally excluded groups? If uh, you... Thanks, Jude. Um, big question um, and, a, and a hugely important question. I mean, um, in some of the more successful programmes that I've seen that have been in this space, um, it one comes back to the design piece uh, that I mentioned up front around, you know, how how do you actually do user research, design experiences, um, and continue to test that with communities that are less well served? And some of the practical things that we did as, as part of those programs was, it goes right back to the team that are delivering uh, that. So it's not just about meeting people where they are. It's about ensuring that there's a diverse um, team that is actually underpinning the delivery model and, and actually getting out there and, and being able to build the relationship and resonate with um, groups of individuals to drive that and understand that insight. Um, and that's anything from, you know, meeting folks where, you, where they are, whether that be, you know, homelessness shelters and be able to actually um have real discussions have the you know over a cup of coffee with a with a biscuit and you know just actually have that um really informal but extremely um uh sort of in insightful discussion uh how you engage community leaders and and faith leaders um and and all of this sounds oh great chris but that sounds expensive and a lot of effort um it will pay dividends in the long run get that up front really ensure that you've got the diversity in your team and that you're meeting people where they are uh, and being able to actually properly engage not just pay lip service to engaging people i think the second thing is from a technology perspective Mara, you, you touched on, on the example of your parents and uh you know touch screen and phones technology is changing as well right so um one of my elder relatives uh, I bought her uh, uh, an Alexa uh, for Christmas and she said why the heck have you bought me that there's not a cat in hell's chance I'll be able to use it now fast forward uh, two or three weeks later she's listening to Elvis she's checking out the weather and suddenly she's found that she can do the same thing on her phone and be able to look at m &S. So suddenly the, the, the technology advances is actually creating more accessible experiences for individuals as well. And the third one I'm going to touch on, and it's not practical, um, but it is what needs to happen. This, this is about a systemic approach to reducing um, uh, inequalities and inequities. So this morning, the BBC News reported about a pilot of the NHS paying for people's electricity bills because of the dire impact on the, of the cost of living on certain patient groups. Now, a lot of this burden gets laid at the NHS's front door. This is not about necessarily just the health service, it's about housing, it's about education, it's about criminal justice. Um, you know, and, and why aren't we thinking about, you know, if I take a, a home from a social housing provider, that part of that package comes with internet access, with you know uh, a property that is uh, ready to be able to harness uh, digital innovations um because the overall impact on society will be net positive yes it's a massive uh, massive transformation in the way that we deliver um you know societal change but only when we start to think about it as a system will we really see um real reduction in uh, inequities across uh, public services that's a long-winded answer and may not be that practical, 
um, but it's that's my my perspective. It's a great answer, Chris. I particularly like your last point, and I think from where I am, I can see there is potential change coming with the you know with integrated care systems and integrated care boards where you know, health and social care are now working alongside voluntary community sector, housing, police, fire. So it is that kind of whole approach to a person and a problem. So I have more hope than I have in a number of years that that kind of view is now being adopted because I think you're right, it is systemic change. So fascinating answer, thank you. Um, so we've kind of talked about digital inclusion. Um, another question that I've got, which I'll direct to you first, Amar, if that's okay is um, just to flip it on its head then and ask about how can digital help with health inequalities? Have you got any views on that? Yeah, I think um, just taking a step back and looking at health inequalities um, as a whole environment, um, there's a lot of work that's been done in the centre to try and address that. Um, so NHS England have got their core cool, um, 20 plus 5 approach where they're looking at the 20% 20, 20 most deprived communities, and then also the five key areas. And I'm pleased to see that that's the direction that they're going in because health inequalities has been a bit of a um, unwieldy beast, I think, in the past. Um, I think it was quite difficult to kind of look at where do you start with health inequalities. Um, a lot of the points I think come to um, things around access as one of the kind of key early barriers when we're talking about digital and how everybody could use it. Um, so some of the points that Chris was talking about in terms of well, why can't housing come along with internet access, for example. Um, and one of the, so the project that I talked about in terms of the, with the cash machines, um, one of the things that kind of came out as part of that um, was that what we found on the ground was very different to the insights that were coming out at a national level. So there was a lot of insight around the time that, you know, it's not just the young people who are using digital, you've also got the, this age of the silver surfers. Um, and although there was, that, that was true to some level, um, there was a complete uh, other side of it where some of the audiences were completely detached and removed from it. So I think it's looking at how do you uh, again, and again, it goes back to what Mari was saying earlier on about digital being an enabler. Um, how do you use the, the digital tools and services in a community setting so that those who are digitally excluded um, can also access the same service? So in that same project, um, the insights that we got influenced a lot of how um, the council was delivering the service. Um, on the ground so um, they built in that element to kind of have that wraparound that made sure that nobody was, was excluded from accessing the service because accessing that service could have meant that if you were eligible to, to receive support you could have received um, a 12-month one-to-one behaviour change intervention programme that could help you to stop smoking or eat better or have a um, better well-being so having that community level, um, I think, is a really good early step in terms of tackling some of those inequalities around access. Lovely, thank you. Mari, Chris, do you have anything to add? Shall I move on to the next question? Yeah, maybe just um, because we're, we're, we're talking about where industry could play a role, and this is, again, somewhere I feel is really important. So um, when I was listening to both, one of the first things I thought about was so in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, the mobile phone companies um, give access to communities, give free phones and free data to communities so they're not isolated. I'm not saying that we're, you know, I'm not comparing the UK, but I am comparing some of our health inequalities brutally to some of the things that are happening in other countries. We are more developing than we are developed in some of our things, which is not something to be proud of. So I do think industry could step up and be part of that solution. I also think if you look at the um, Edelman Global Trust Barometer, if you look at UK part of it, when it comes to comms, um, right now people trust the, their boss more than they trust the government. <laughs> they trust their boss more than they, govern, they trust healthcare. And um, so where does industry wider have a role to play? Where does that workplace have a role to play? So, I think there's something quite 
interesting. I was probably quite focused on my narrow healthcare industry, but you know, is there a wider way to get that access for those people um, it, in the workplace where they are working? Is there a way to widen it too? Um, and I do think it has to be a kind of almost a all hands in approach to really make a difference um, there as well. But I'm quietly excited that this might be the time that everyone's coming to that same conclusion as well, where um, people in planet and community before profit, you know, all of those things are coming. Um, the growing tech trend with B Corp, um, you know, within industry uh, to, to be that giving solid community. Is this our chance um, to really bring that without eroding trust, coming back to Chris's first point? Because really it all hangs on trust. So um, I think it might be worth going back and looking at the trust barometer. I'm going to do that after this um, and reread it and see what I can take out of that based on that too. Yeah, it's a really good point that Endelman barometer, it has completely shifted, shifted on its head and the power that bosses have now. And I think certainly some of the most successful interventions in terms of health prevention that the NHS has seen is when they do partner with industry. So I can think of an example where um, the NHS went into Coca-Cola manufacturing plant and did health screening and same with being q over 50s and they have screening buses in their car parks it's that's what's going to make that difference so i think you're right there's an enormous role for industry to play as well rather than just handing it all over um to the nhs to social care and to politicians so yeah fascinating insights thank you I've got a great question that's come through, which I'd really like to hear from all three of you. We've probably just got time for each of you to make a point of it. And the question is, what problems can't be solved through technology? Um, what healthcare problems can't be solved through technology? Would anybody like to go first on that one? Anybody got any immediate thoughts? Or, or do you want to counter that and say, actually, they all can be? Chris, you look like you're ready to go. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so, I'd say two things. Um, one, funding. Uh, the system just needs more money to be able to actually deliver uh, and to deliver the transformation that's required. Two, um, the, the kind of culture and the change underneath it. Technology is just an enabler. Um, technology in its own right is not going to fix um, and change uh, how people adopt technology. So I think um, for me, it entirely comes back to to people and back to the basics in, you know, you know Amai talked about sort of behavioral science and, you know, really understanding how to deliver change. That That for me is absolutely key and I, I don't really think the theory has changed uh, particularly over the years there's different methods but we absolutely have to keep going back to basics of how you deliver change perfect thank you Mari any thoughts on what healthcare problems can't be solved by digital um, I think the bit that digital is not there with yet is that very soft skill of um, listening and care, that social skill that, that you know, most people I know in the NHS have, that beautiful skill that can move someone through something. Behaviour change, especially in chronic illness, is, is um, a really difficult thing and it is self-led, but you do need that person at the right time, I guess. So, that's the gap it has. I'm not saying it always will have um, because AI is getting better. It's why I like to follow the bots and see how they're improving, how they build their relationships, you know. Um, AI is improving, but I think that, again, it's back to that combined, combining where playing to the strengths that is digital, playing to the strengths that is NHS and creating some time and resource in our exhausted workforce to actually come back to that care, which is what's really, you know, um, a, a critical part of it. 
Fabulous, thank you. I'm afraid we are up against time, so Amar, if you had a wonderful thing to throw in, I'm not going to come to you. I'm also conscious, Newman, you have your hands up, um, but I'm afraid we are at time, so I'm conscious that people on this call are busy diaries. So all that um, is left to me to do is to say um, thank you to everybody for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something that's given you food for thought. Keep an eye out for any future events, and also the recording of this will come out. And then finally, I want to say a massive thank you to Namu, who has organised everything in the background and done all the hard work. Um, and also to our brilliant speakers, um, Chris, Amar and Mari. And once again, thank you to everybody for joining and have a good afternoon and rest of the week. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.